Stories our community hears about black women have changed over the centuries, yet one thing remains consistent. Black women have always found a way to beat the odds. From the battling the hardships and the abuse that came with the burden of slavery to the justified legal oppression faced once formal slavery was abolished, the black woman has made her needs and the needs of the people known through a voice strong enough to be heard and recognized in a world where men have always been a figurehead. The black woman is not one to stay silent in everyday injustices, to remain passive when change was demanded. It was not necessary for her to be seen. However, it was her voice, the steady pulse that became the undercurrent for change. She was the one making the connections to the community. She was the one organizing grassroots movements, protests, and sit-ins. Bridge women went unseen and underappreciated. They were doing the groundwork and heading the influential projects, doing the work that was just as deserving of recognition as either Dr. King or Malcolm X. And this was the involvement. She began to evolve into a force to be reckoned with, recognized and respected. Despite the lack of public recognition, the radical black woman helped to shape, helped to shape and expand ideas about the black female identity during the 60s and 70s. Radicalism. The going against the norm and the work that you do is not defined by the means used to get there. The varied faces of the radical black women can be seen in the likes of Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer, as well as Betty Shabazz and Marion Spencer. Not to be defined by the means they took, but the changes they made against an unfair society. Betty Shabazz, the wife of Malcolm X, was an independent in her own right. After meeting Malcolm and joining the nation, she showed passion for helping better the lives of women in the nation and children in the inner city. Her active work as a chairwoman for the 41st National Council of Negro Women Convention and in efforts for education reform carry her legacy on long past her time she had to carry them out. Marion Spencer was a local hero to the city of Cincinnati. Her tireless work with the Young Women Christian Association started in her college years and carried on far past graduation when she ran as the first black woman for the Cincinnati Public School Board. Sadly, she did not win the election because they thought her actions were far too radical for the time. Harriet Tudman, Ida B. Wells, and Septima Clark were women whose quiet voices forced change. Revolutionary work in the efforts towards registering Southern Blacks to vote were headed by the efforts of Septima Clark. Although her name is not as well known as others of her time, her work precedes her. In addition to teaching older adults a safer avenue towards helping the movement, and working as part of the NAACP, she was active in the Southern Christian Leadership Council. It was the quiet steps during the dead of night, the voice in print, or the refusal to move that made those around them take notice of the injustices of blacks in America. The sustained silence work, toward, work done by women during the height of the civil rights movement in the 60s and the more radical women of the 1970s was a much needed companion besides the workings of men preaching black power. During the Civil Rights Movement, which we all framed with marches and sit-ins and blacks being hosed down in the streets, there were women behind the organization of these events. In Sherry Park's Fierce Angels, she explains how during the Civil Rights Movement, in respect to the student organizations, women were behind the unglamorous work thought to be beneath men. However, it was that, if not completed, would have led to the failure of some protests during the struggle. Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the most influential activists of her time, started out as a SNCC field officer in 1963, pounding the pavement, getting blacks in the South to register to vote. It was often the face-to-face -face contact that built the momentum for the cause, hearing the efforts and fears and concerns of those oppressed, providing encouragement during times of doubt, all the gentle and nurturing support of a woman. Hamer had felt the effects of police violence against blacks firsthand. The brutality she had experienced in jail only further fueled her efforts towards making change. Her actions, though not as forceful as the like of an Angela Davis, still defined radicalism for a black woman. Not only was she not accepting the practice of de jour and de facto laws in the South, she was not allowing someone else to fight her battle. As a woman, she willingly put herself in the front line in, naming of, in the name of change. She was one of the minds behind the sit-in organizations in the South and further protest segregation. The support she showed for the drastic effort that were taken was her radicalism. Just like the strong contrast between the views of 
Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, some black women found themselves also holding a more forceful radicalism and ideology. Women like Angela Davis and Kathleen Cleaver began to attack not only the social injustice of racism, but the highly ignored struggles of sexism behind head on. This new breed of black women began to a dialogue that forced those around to recognize as both black and female a new force to be reckoned with. With the changing of the times came also the change as to how the black woman viewed herself. Through the more passive form of radicalism, a path was formed to give voice to a much louder form of protest. Their names, Marion Spencer and Shirley Chisholm, went from the unrecognizable to the front page declarations of martyrdom, Angela Davis and Kathleen Cleaver. The, direct, the different generations had to be taken into consideration along with the different views of women from behind from different backgrounds. Women like Angela Davis, who grew up with an outstanding education and having been well-traveled, had differing perspectives of national issues than women who had never thought deeply about anything happening around the world. The women in the 70s built on the work that had been done before them, but allowed it to evolve to show their changed attitude. This change in attitude by women was inevitable. As the rights behind her were being fought for, it proved a light into what was not given to her as a woman. She would become aware of herself not only as someone's daughter or wife, but as an entity that existed solely independent. As an independent person, femininity grew. With this, three spheres of femininity demanded these women's attention. One. Black women needed to redefine the feminism that meant for them within the intersection of sexism in addition to racism. Two, they needed to regain control of their bodies from abuse. And three, they needed to address the necessity of rebuilding self-esteem after decades of being told that they were not fit within the boundaries of Western beauty. While grappling with these new understanding of self, the she also had to deal with community reactions, both the ones that wanted to build them and the ones that wanted to tear them down. This new black woman had to face challenges of defining what being a woman was. This would not be an easy undertaking. There was no path to follow, no role models to imitate. She was now defining something new that went against not only the, social, the societal ideas of being black, but the traditional expectations of what it meant to be female. Change is never easy, and yet these women were forcing yet another change during an already tumultuous time. Unknowingly, these women had taken on a challenge to build a stable foundation of what it would mean to be a black woman in America. Black feminism has had many transformations since its inception in the 1960s and 1970s. Initially, women had become, initially women had became icons were not preaching a new era of womanhood directly. Though their powerful roles in the fight against inequality and injustices were given women a voice. However, with the mass public distribution of the new voice of black women, people began to follow them and understand that black women could transcend society's standards. Magazine covers of Angela Davis thrusting her fist in the air was the public association with the new black woman and her new sense of power. The evolution from a respectable woman drastically shifted to images of women leaving their hair natural, arming themselves, and actively speaking out, thus disassociating themselves from societal norms of how women should act. And the societal norms were not just those established by white America. They were also distancing and speaking out against the very organizations that were fighting for equality for blacks. They found themselves being challenged by male leadership in organizations such as SNCC and the Black Panther Party. As the black woman was now the alleged cause for a decline in black masculinity. It was the stories of sexism within the organizations that preached fairness for all that gave a new empowering example of women in the black community to use as a source of inspiration. Radical women are rarely heard of throughout history. Our hegemonic society does more to overshadow the achievements of women than celebrate them. The achievements of women in general are great, but the accomplishments of black women can be argued to have a higher sense of achievement because of the dual limitations that society poses on them. Not only are they fighting on the war front of women's equality, but they are also fighting for racial equality. In 1972, presidential candidate Shirley Chisholm became the first they became the epitome of black women's challenge. Formerly, only men, white men, had 
held any power in the way of making significant change. So when Chisholm made a name for herself in the community, reaction was less than inviting. Shirley Chisholm was not only the first black person to run for president, but she was also the first woman. In a male-dominant society, Chisholm had to face the belief that women were not capable of handling such a high-demanding job as a presidency. That, as a female, decisions would be made more for, from an emotional state than one of intellect or logic. In addition, she had to face the long-perceived idea that blacks were still inferior and less intelligent than whites. Despite her failed attempt to win the election, Chisholm helped to break the stereotype from, for both females and blacks by becoming the first black woman to hold a state-elected seat in the House of Representatives. The understanding that politics held power to make the changes, Shirley Chisholm was in a position where she was able to be to redefine feminism in the face of politics. In the face of America, being forced to recognize blacks as respected citizens, there was a realization that blacks would be demanding equality beyond a place in front of the bus. Chisholm was a beacon of hope. As we continue to learn from class, black women experienced a constant intersection between race and sexism. The environment on Capitol Hill was no different. Chisholm was considered a bridge leader, not unlike the Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Bakers during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. The battle of defining the role of feminism is also a very private one. At young ages, society tells women that they should be sexually conservative and they should wait until marriage. Don't give the milk the way for free is an adage that has been heard by many young teen girls as they reached puberty and began to explore their own sexuality. This message is only heightened for black women because they have the history of being hypersexual creatures who cannot control their bodily urges. Tarion Williams, author of Scandalize My Name, takes us through her, her experience in college of balancing her religion and her coming into her sexuality. Her answer to struggling with her new sexual environment was the black church. The church responded to her with No More Shades campaign preaching that the answer to possible deviance of the Lord's word was prayer and supplication. Here, there was no choice. The black society, including the black church and historical stereotypes, placed such strict restrictions on a woman's body that her choices that to fail, to fail to comply left one ostracized from the very community where she had found refuge. They neither they either must deny themselves the sexual freedom that everyone else has granted or be forced to live up to the stereotypes that society already bestowed upon them. Whether it be regaining control of their sexual freedom or their bodily safety, black women have often been subjected to a vulnerable condition. As feminism was being more defined and accepted, black women were taking back their bodies. No longer was it just about one's, having, one's choice to have sex, there was now more control over the violence that has once been tolerated as acceptable because of perceived heightened male superiority over women. Though domestic abuse is not defined by race, the historical fight black women have had over their bodies has left them battered but not broken. Outside causes also affect the black woman's experience when domestic abuse is considered. These outstanding facts, such as unequal unemployment opportunities, can be traced back to the hazardous effects of white supremacy. The odds are not in favor for blacks due to the fact that the system was created to benefit whites and is maintained to keep them in a more advantageous position. Since the days of slavery, black women have fought to establish a high level of self-esteem due to the lack of positive and respected imagery of being both black and female. That being said, there have been changes. The finding of, of Kaznev and Strauss came to the conclusion that black women were more embedded in community and have less reportings of domestic abuse, proving that community ties and outside influences play a part in the decline of domestic abuse. This suggests that the beauty of black women and female has begun to be regarded as something to be cherished. Through community and the backing of the justice system, black women have found the strength and voice and a large sense of empowerment. With this sense of empowerment, the new image of black beauty was no longer conforming to Western standards. The necessary yet covert evolution of a compilation of black beauty and culture is reflected in Toby Jenkins' My Culture, My Color, Myself. But one of the more most cultural lessons learned from one our time wrestling with the idea of cultures that he that the histories of struggle 
were sources of pain and pride. In the age of black power and black love, people like Angela Davis and Kathleen Cleaver embraced their natural beauty and became national and international icons of self-aware, beautiful black women. This declaration of connecting to a blackness, a blackness that was made by black people for black people was their way of telling the word, world that they were through being told they were not enough. Black was beautiful. The public reaction at the time was fully embracing the new mantra that black was beautiful. After decades of comparing shades of blackness, black women were beginning to debunk the idea that there w- that what was to be considered beautiful. In 1968, the Greater Milwaukee Star reported, There is a tremendous identity crisis in the physical appearance. Black kids live in a society in which white beauty is viewed as supreme. This is a myth. Black people were now encouraged to embrace all shades of black beauty and condemn the outdated practice of beauty pageant. She was now in the spotlight of the world. Angela Davis would become a representative for the everyday black woman. Newspapers around the world were beginning to hear the plight of blacks and women in America in a different light and were putting international pressure on the U.S. for change. Following Davis's incarceration, people from Tanzania to Germany were aware of the situation. As her own sister, Fania, states in an interview that all women should come to the defense of Angela. She tells of how she heard of Angela's incarceration while she was in Cuba and the different perspectives she was able to get abroad on, to get abroad only opened her eyes to the rampant injustices that were happening to political prisoners. It was the mistake of the U.S. government for imprisoning her on the faulty tar- charges she was accused of. Prisons stood no chance to silence Angela or those who believed in her innocence. Thinking contemporary applications of this theory led us to the readings of Maya Angelou. Angelou's writings were subtle messages hinting at critiques of national identity and feminism. Though charged with kidnapping and providing armed weaponry, her case highlighted America's biased judicial system, which targeted Davis simply because they could not control her. The November edition of the 1971 The Radical Teacher published letters from people around the world who sympathized with her unjust incarceration. She became an international icon. Her strong will led people to see beyond her the stereotypes others had imposed upon her. She was a woman of her own mind. She was an African-American of her own convictions. She became the voice of radical feminism. As feminism grew, black women began to understand that they were no longer in a fight alone. They became part of a larger movement that demands rights for all women. Color aside, the feminism movement was now moving its way to the forefront of black women's vision. Although they did not all agree on this, on the ways to gain their equality, black women were treating the feminism movement as if it was an offshoot of the civil rights movement. In 1970, women's liberation meeting in, 19, in New York prompted projects on abortion, working to free jailed Black Panther women, and work to establish women's studies programs on college campuses. The general air of this meeting, as, respo- as reported in the militant, was that women from all walks of life were banding together to fight for women's liberation. Their own understanding of being women added to their understanding of their being Black. Black women have led to narration from the background for far too long than they have gotten credit for. Names have gone unknown and work has gone unrecognized. Arguably, black people have a whole, as a whole have done more to build this country than any other race. They have unwillingly sacrificed tradition and heritage to succumb to a life of second-class citizenship. Their trials and hardships are not only coming to the surface for the modern generation, to the continue to continue their work. The message and images of radical black women that have been covered are only examples of how to coach a whole people on self-respect, self-determination, and self-love. My initial thoughts going into this project was that I was going to learn about black feminism and that I was only going to be one definition. I had already accounted for the differing meanings of radical. Upon doing research, I learned that there were different views of coping with the changing conditions of being a black woman in the U.S. It only took hearing these women's phenomenal stories to be inspired to learn more. In this day and age, we are faced with a new civil rights movement. This one does not have to be 
This one does not have to transcend the limitations of television and radio, but is broadcasted on social media and their internet. I learned that the black radical woman in the past did not go through perils that she did for the next generation to sit idly by and wait for something to change. They did this. They did it as an example for us to come to see that change can happen and that we have to be the ones to do something about it.